Assalamu alaikum and welcome to today's episode of Karbala Reflections. Today we would like to discuss caring for others, selflessness, and ethar. I'm joined today by Dr. Amina and Dr. Kate to discuss ethar in Islamic terminology in our culture and in our day-to-day lives. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining me today. I think for many, we should start from what is ethar? Well, simply put, the value of giving whatever you have without expectation, uh, as embodied uh, first and foremost by the Holy Prophet ﷺ, who gave his uh, efforts, uh, his wealth, also Hazrat Khadija gave her wealth as well, his time, uh, and basically his entire life to serve Allah and to try to uplift humanity. Uh, same with the rest of the family of the Prophet, especially Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, who we are remembering in these days. So the idea of giving whatever one has and giving of oneself, uh, but in such a way that, as they say, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing or the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Uh, not that we want status from people or acknowledgement or even thank you, but ideally for a higher cause. And sometimes I think it goes a bit deeper than that. It's not just giving what you have. It's it's very different to have a hundred dollars and give fifty away mm. to having fifty one dollars and giving fifty away. Mm. Well, I think I was just kind of thinking of um, whether it's hadith or just but kind of especially during Ramadan or when Imam Ali alayhi salam and Fatima alayhi salam, the Islam were, were fasting and it came to the end of the fast. If a poor person or whatever knocked on their door, they would actually give away all their food and they would they would go hungry for another kind of day. And that, for me, embodies that, that self-sacrifice. Yeah. Obviously, as well as Imam Hussein alayhi salam, sacrificed himself and his family. Um, but it's, yeah, it's that, I think, you know, like you say, it's, I think a lot of us will we'll give a bit, but we'll keep, you know, as long as we're comfortable, we can give a bit here as well. I'll give what I don't need. Yeah, but exactly. And um, But it's actually giving in that moment where you desperately need something, but actually to give it away to, to somebody else who probably has a greater need, that that's the real self-sacrifice. And I think what Dr. Mina was saying about the expectation, you know, that we might give something away, whether it's sadaka or, or whatever, but there's, you know, what do we expect? Do we expect anything in return? Um, whether it's this life or next life. I mean, obviously, expecting something in the next life is, is better, but actually, there's that thing that do we do it for a kind of a reward? Do we do it for the reward of Allah? Do we do something for fear of Allah? Or do we do it for love of love. Allah? Mm. And I think that's where we have to kind of aspire to be and con- constantly kind of reflect whenever we give away anything. What is the reason I'm doing this? Why am I doing it? And try and at least move towards doing it for love of Allah and not wanting anything in return. MashaAllah, very beautiful. Yeah, and I exactly like you said, it's something we can all aspire to and it's not something we should necessarily feel feel sad about if we're not at that level because again alhamdulillah we've been given an opportunity to work on ourselves mm. and ultimately that's what we get rewarded for being able to find something that we want to improve within ourselves and trying to work to get there i think the most important point that you were mentioning is the sincerity after all allah looks at deeds according mm. to the whole picture like you're saying if someone has two pounds or two dollars and they give them away it's very different to a multimillionaire giving away mm. two pan- pounds uh, allah understands what is the meaning and value of things to us Albeit it's oftentimes said that people who have less are oftentimes more generous. Mm. I think there's sometimes some truth to that. Uh, But also, as we were mentioning, the reasons why. Uh, And the imams are like this too. Sometimes people would offer them a large amount of money, you know, fisa bilala or uh, homes from people who were not really doing everything that they Mm. should have been doing with respect to the imamate and they didn't take it, but they would accept small amounts of money from people who were sincere. Uh, or, for example, Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, on the way to Karbala, he met someone who said, that basically, I don't want to join you, I don't really want to fight, I'm not interested in putting myself on the line, but, but you can have my horse or you can have my sword. Mm. And the Imam didn't take it because this is not what he wanted. It was a sort of all or nothing, mm. that either you 
you're here completely for the sake of Allah or you are not. Of course, he didn't ask anyone to come with him. But nonetheless, he wasn't interested in just going around and collecting donations for the cause, so to speak. Uh, it was a, a higher sort of sacrifice that he was involved in. Albion, I do think it's good to balance that out with what the Holy Quran does say, which is that um, it's not good to give everything all the time mm-hmm. and it's not good to give nothing. But there is a balance uh, because sometimes, for instance, in Hadith, uh, we are advised not to give if it's going to be at the expense of people who are financial dependent. So if it's mm-hmm. going to harm your children or your if your spouse is a financial dependent or whoever, they have a certain right. It's one thing if they agree to it and they endorse it and they want you yeah. to do it, but to do it by force and to make them suffer by force is mm-hmm. something else. That's not um, that's not what we're being asked to do. But, but to give up your own share is good, of course. Or for example, if you give so much, this is also related in hadith, that then you can't take care of yourself, that sort of defeats the purpose because that places you in a position of dependency and a lack of dignity. Mm. So you do have to balance these things out. Uh, But again, not all giving is financial. Uh, And I do think that perhaps this is a crucial point in this day and age. Uh, There is a lot of money in the world and the reality is just throwing money at problems hasn't solved them. Now, some problems are solved by money. Mm. But I'd say a lot of the structural inequalities in the world are not only going to be solved by a transfer of money. There's other things that need to happen uh, to really try to make the world a more equitable and fairer Mm. place. Having having a balance is exactly like you said, a necessity in any part of our lives, not only in given and absolutely everything that we do. But in my opinion, there's another balance that we need to maintain as well is, is it always a good choice is it always a good option to give is there a limit to how much you should give before people start taking advantage of you perhaps mm-hmm. and i think it, it kind of goes back to what dr me is saying about balance and obviously not giving if it's going to become detrimental to those who are dependent on you and then you would have to go and, and ask for, for someone else but uh, i think perhaps what you're, you're getting at is it being in this society that we live in being giving whether it's in a monetary form or actually in more kind of care or attitude or, or love or compassion can be taken is often taken as a weakness um, mm-hmm. i'm not saying it is at all but this is what i experience with a lot of people who are generally very empathic very caring very nice um it's seen as a weakness and actually you're taken advantage of because people say oh well, she she won't mind if we do this or ask her to do that we'll just do that or Whereas somebody who's maybe more assertive, they'll think twice about asking a favour from that person. So it, it's hard. And I, I kind of come back to, I think it's a hadith. Um, but anyway it's, anyway, it's on judgment day. The oppressor will be questioned, but also the oppressed. And actually, we need to make sure that we're not oppressing ourselves um, by kind of giving too much if it's kind of detrimental and we're being taken advantage of. So it very much comes back to the point of needing to find balance. Um, and that's that's quite a difficult one, I think, for a lot yeah. of people. I think for hu- human beings in general, finding balance, the middle path, which is what Islam espouses, is is that's where we need to get because it's much easier to go from one extreme to another. It's it's human nature generally. It's trying to find hold that line, hold that tension between the two. Because um, even in the terms of self sacrifice, it's easy to say, oh, "I'll give everything," you know. Um, sometimes it could be hard to say, well, I do need to keep that because I'm responsible for those children or these parents, but therefore I can give that. Well, I think um, that also brings up the question of what you are giving for. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in sometimes in everyday situations where people might be a little bit taking advantage of someone, what they're asking is not sacrifice for the sake of Allah, like mm. was there on the day of Ashura. It may just be things that they don't want to pay someone to do or they can't be bothered to do mm. themselves. Or they may be important things, but not at the same level of day of Ashura, giving your life because it is the right mm. thing to do. And, and that is obvious. I do think as women in general, we are socialized not to say no when people yeah. ask. And there is a lot of guilt in saying no uh, or to put other people mm. above our health or well-being. And, and like you said, it is important to balance that. Also, people in the caring professions yeah. like education, healthcare, and so forth. Again, there is a pressure mm. not to know where to draw the line. But uh, yeah, if you don't draw the line, then your mm. own health suffers and, and you aren't able to serve uh, mm. in the end if you aren't looking out for yourself. And so that, that is a good point. It's related mm. from Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, uh, to serve your brethren in faith. But if they take you as a servant, so basically they're taking advantage of you, then mm. stop serving them. 
And I think that's a good general guideline. I mean, insofar as people aren't treating you as their slave, then of course be there at their service. But mm -hmm. we can yeah. usually tell when that line is crossed. And at that point, you are giving up your dignity, which is an inherent aspect of the position before Allah. And mm -hmm. you, you can politely say no at that point. Yeah, I think. That's... Or a piece of advice I got once. Mm -hmm. This was actually from, from a teacher at a seminar because he was talking about how in education, a lot of times you, you can't say no when people ask you to do things. He said, tell them, I'll think about it. Yeah. And think about it. And if they ask you again, say you'll think about it again. Mm. Is there is there any time that it's other than the, the hadith that you just narrated, that it's just not a good idea to give? Well, that's really a circumstance by circumstance decision. I, I mean, giving in general in Islam, like in other faiths, is good, whether it's sadaqa or even just yeah. giving gifts is recommended. I mean, I, the one I think giving for potential haram, and I always, yeah. what I think, you know, when you walk past the streets and you see people asking for money, and I, you know, I'm really kind of in a dilemma, because if I give that person money, how do I know they're not going to go and buy alcohol with it and just get more drunk or go and buy drugs? So often what I'll do is go and buy a sandwich or food or something like that. So I think it's... Exactly. Personally, you know. when I when I'm confronted in this situation, because I do find it very difficult to know what the right thing is, mm -hmm. is it still to give or is it not to when you don't know where um, in the example that you mentioned, the money is going to go. Mm -hmm. I prefer going and buying the food and giving mm -hmm. it to them. But it's, it's, a, it's a conflict I have within yeah. me because I'm not sure if that's the right thing to do. So mm -hmm. does Islam tell us anything in this regard? When it comes to giving charity, one of the things that's mentioned is to follow the heart. Yeah. But in addition to that, um, in some cases it's said that giving a loan is more dignified than giving yeah. charity. Because when you just give someone money, it's first yeah. of all, it sets up a power dynamic. Even if you don't intend to, it mm. puts them at a lower level. Uh, they feel like they're losing their dignity. Sometimes it creates a dependency cycle. And other, of course, there are times when you just have to give. But mm. if, if the option to give a loan there, it, it can help preserve the other person's dignity and mm. doesn't set up that mm. permanent situation, so to speak. And most people don't feel embarrassed when they take a mm. loan. Like if I go to the bank and get a loan, I, I don't feel embarrassed. But, but they do feel embarrassed if they are just being given charity because mm. that's how we are. Mm. Of course, it is charitable to forgive a loan. Yeah. Um, it, it is very good to do that. But that's a different sort of situation. But I, I really, that's less embarrassing yeah. too, to, to have a loan forgiven, say, after five mm. years mm. Uh, than to be put in the position of having to beg for money in the first place. Um, so this sort of thing, it's a situation by situation basis, of course. I, I mean, if someone is in desperate situation, mm. it may be that giving money or, or giving assistance is the right thing to mm. do. Um, and you know, we have the intellect and the heart, and, and we can try mm. to see what is best. But I just think it's, it's a really good point about giving a loan, because like you say, it, it's, it empowers the person that you're giving to. And I think by giving too much, it actually yeah disempowers that, that person or that keeps them kind of stuck where they are. And it's it's a classic, you give somebody a fishing rod rather than the fish so that they can then go on and kind of create a whole livelihood for themselves. And I think, yeah, it's actually thinking about the impact if we do give, yeah. what that impact is going to have on the person that we yeah. give to, whether it's they're going to take advantage of it, they're going to feel kind of more disempowered. Um, I think especially when dealing with young people, like teenagers, for example, mm. uh, I, I think that giving guidance and life advice uh, it can be really invaluable. That means mm. very valuable, by the way. Uh, sometimes, again, I think for some people, they just put money in a situation yeah. because they don't know what to do, or it's easier to, for some people to write a check if they have money. But mm. to actually sit with a young person, help them with career planning, life planning, study skills, whatever it is, and then to help them fund whatever they need to do is likely to have a much bigger impact on their life. And there's plenty of people who do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just saying that you know sometimes there's a custom when it comes to charitable giving of, of just writing these yeah, checks yeah. and not thinking about where it goes afterwards. So yeah, but mm -hmm. of course, if you do work with nonprofit organizations, you see all the challenges that are involved, uh, even in getting money or goods to where they need to go, mm -hmm. uh, let alone af actually offering human services. So, so sometimes, I'm not saying not to give, but I'm mm -hmm. saying sometimes there, there's more that can be done with time I think that, giving that time is, I think giving yes. time is yeah, the ultimate thing valuable. you can give yeah more valuable to than someone anything, I think. and I, I believe I've read a hadith that it's giving goes a bit deeper than just giving who who asks of you because it's very important to also give to those who don't 
Absolutely. Even the Holy Quran no, mentions God. this, that oftentimes we don't recognize the people around us who are in need because they are shy to show it. But, but you can see, if you have eyes, you can see that uh, this is someone who is in need and they're just not mentioning it to you. Mm -hmm. It is good to be alert to that because a lot of times we don't necessarily notice the people around us who mm -hmm. are in need. And it can be in need of a lot of things too. For some people, there's the basics like food or a house or mm -hmm. transportation. And sometimes it's the more intangibles, like support, advice, encouragement, love, and so forth. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yes, the, the wise person will not just look at people and assume they have a brilliant mm -hmm. life and everything is perfect because you don't know what's going yeah. on behind the scenes. And I think on the kind of converse side of that is that we also have, need to know how to receive. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, particularly people that don't like to ask, you know, often it can be hard to, re to receive. And I think Absolutely. often it can be quite easy to feel to be able to give because yeah. you, you get that warm feeling yeah. that you've done something good yeah. but actually it can be very difficult to, to, to receive as well it can make you feel kind of quite uncomfortable inside yeah. And yeah. I do agree that it is a skill in and of itself and some mm. people are excellent givers but it is difficult to receive back uh, the importance of receiving gifts is mm. also mentioned in hadith for example it said that someone gave a gift to one of the wives of the prophet uh, peace be upon him and his family uh, and she was a very poor lady so this wife but the prophet didn't want to accept it because she felt like I shouldn't take this thing mm. from the woman and then the prophet explained to her that she's actually embarrassed this woman because when you come to give someone something you you know, you have some expectation, maybe mm -hmm. some insecurity. Are they going to like it? Are they not going to like it? Yeah. You know, how do you feel when you give someone something and they say, oh, I don't like that color or yeah. I don't need this and have it back? Yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. you feel bad mm. when someone rejects mm. your gift. So mm. he, he explained yeah. to her that she could have just taken it and then discreetly sometime yeah. in the future, she could have given the woman something back and, and it actually takes they would have been happy. But generosity it, to receive. That's so a way good way of phrasing it. By receiving, you're actually uh -huh, giving yeah. as well because you're actually uh -huh. giving to the person who's... And I mean, giving, giving having... having the opportunity to give, be it time or money mm. or anything else, doesn't only benefit the receiver, does it? And it no, benefits. it benefits the giver more, I would say, you yeah. know, in terms right. of that, that it gives you that warm feeling and they've, they've proven this. So, you know, if you give it, it just gives you that nice warm feeling. And uh, yeah, the, the, the receiver may feel a bit of shame or embarrassment or whatever. Um, but actually, I would say it's the giver and I, I don't know if it's Hadith about this but I, I know anyway in psychology you actually get more from giving than you do receiving I so. think we have Hadiths about that as well do we not well this is why Zakat benefits. is called Zakat because mm -hmm. first and foremost it purifies the person who is giving um, some of our ulama say or have said that um, giving is such a blessing for the giver that as soon as you come across a situation where you have the opportunity to share you have to seize it right away and give right away because mm -hmm. otherwise shaitan is going to come in and intercede between you and what you're going to give. So in order to outrace the shaitan, so to speak, uh, you rush to give what you have. Mm -hmm. In any case, all of this goes back fundamentally to the belief that whatever we possess, whether it's wealth, whether it's food, um, whether it's family, whether it's lifespan is from Allah and, and we are only custodians. Uh, and for all of us, there's going to be something that's going to be most difficult mm -hmm. to give. It's not always the money or, or the material goods. For some mm -hmm. people it is. But there's usually one thing that's most beloved to a person, whether mm -hmm. it's a job or a title, um, a parent, a child, a sibling, mm -hmm. a friend. Kind words. <laughs> uh, whatever it happens yeah. to be, um, an ideology, mm -hmm. that there's something that is most important to us. Um, and if they lose that thing, then there's nothing else in life. And oftentimes, that's the thing Allah asks us to give in life. Yeah. So it is a trial, but it comes to people in different ways. Mm -hmm. And it's a reminder, too, that whatever we love above Allah is a form of shirk or associating something with Allah. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not saying Allah is going to send us to hell for, for a natural human instinct. But nonetheless, these are the areas where we oftentimes are most tested. And this is where the idea of ithar comes out because it is the idea of giving everything. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, again, there are gradations, so to speak. I mean, Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura, we say, for example, he gave his son, he gave his family. Um, our, our belief, or, or my belief at least, is that uh, human beings are the property of Allah. I, I don't say I own this child, I own mm -hmm. this sibling, I own this cousin. Uh, I don't own them to be able to say, okay, you will die and you will be martyred. And of course, they, they chose, I mean, except for what happened to Ali al-Asghar because that was done by the enemy. Uh, but the point being, being willing to offer back whatever we perceive that we have some share in to Allah mm -hmm. is very important. But to be able to do that on a higher level does come with the cognizance that the ultimate authority and ownership is with mm -hmm. Allah. 
and not with ourselves. And that can be very difficult for some mm. people. I think particularly with, with mm. mother with children, mm. you know, we know to is it a mana, a trust from Allah, that, you know, I think with the emotions, we kind of think they're our children and probably one of the worst pains a parent could experience is to lose a child. But yeah, it's coming back to we don't own, we don't own them. It, they're on and loan, if you like, from Allah. And everything we hold dear is is a loan Indeed. from Allah. Everything and in the universe. Yeah, it's just kind of coming back to that, and I guess coming back to self sacrifice when you can truly well, feel even that. Well, then said, peace be mm, upon him when he laid Hazrat Fatima to rest, and he's mm, returning the loan that was yeah. given to him. Even our physical bodies are loan. Mm. You know, that's we return to the air. True. Buried, so our soul, inshallah, goes back to Allah. So, Inshallah, a very, Inshallah. A very deep and moving conversation. In many ways, I feel like we live in an environment and a society that being selfless is frowned upon. Mm -hmm. I know you touched on it a bit earlier, but I'd love to hear more about it. People associate selflessness with being naive mm -hmm. or being weak. Being weak, and I exactly. Think, yeah, we live in a very selfish narcissistic society you know and I think that the selfie is the classic symbol of the society we live in it's all about me 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 um, and do what I want and, and doesn't matter what anybody else wants and we're, we're really up against this so any time that you you give or, or do anything good especially in London people kind of think well, what are you after <laughs> do you know what I yeah. mean so it's kind of not only frowned upon it's met with suspicion um, so it's kind of trying to stay true to to those virtues of giving and self-sacrifice when we're surrounded by this need for self kind of validation and, and a me narcissistic society is, is is a challenge in itself because I think we have to be I really believe in self-reflection and I think all of us need to do that self-reflection process not only daily but kind of constantly and just kind of ask why are we doing what we're doing because other, if we don't, we're going to get sucked into this kind of selfishness, narcissistic world that we're living in. And actually, we do see it even in our own communities about, you know, how do I look today? What picture can I shove on Instagram? And it's me, me, me. Kind of the idol of me is is probably the biggest idol of our time. Um, so that's why we constantly have to, even we belong to Allah. We're not, we don't own ourselves. You yeah. know, our body, our soul, everything about us belongs to Allah. So it's kind of constantly reminding ourselves everything we have, any virtues we have, any qualities we have, any characteristics we have, you know, the good ones, it's only by virtue or mercy or grace of Allah that we have those. We don't do anything by our own good. Um, and I think that's the way to kind of try and tune in constantly to to doing what we're doing and remembering Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, what, what the self-sacrifice he did, the example of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Um, yeah, I'm sure anyone who, who would hear you talk, um, starting with myself we just want to take the first step to try to get more of this virtue within themselves mm. what would you say to a person who would want to increase this virtue in themselves how could how is it related with getting closer to allah that we benefit and we receive the thing we are looking for well the first step if we wish to inculcate a virtue inside ourselves is to ask allah for help uh, opening yourself up to the acknowledgement that we lack something and we are in need and we can't do everything ourselves is oftentimes mm -hmm. the only thing you need to do but if not it is the first step at least uh, one can simply pretend to have certain virtues can do a little mm -hmm. bit of acting you know there's nothing wrong even if you want to pretend like you're a fictional mm -hmm. character maybe some kind of superhero or something and with whatever you want to be whether it's selfless whether it's brave whether it's something else uh, these sort of mental mm -hmm. games if you will can help to to navigate the challenges of life and help us build uh, modeling people is a big thing uh, we do take after tremendously those people who we associate with, especially uh, face to face. There's a reason why it is recommended to spend time with the mu'mineen, the, the true believers, because it leaves an impact uh, on the soul, whether we're aware of it mm. or not. I mean, I do think that in general, we tend to primarily emulate our families, uh, whether it's biological family or if someone grows up in an adoptive family or whatever. We, we mm. emulate what we see in our upbringing. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, if, if these values are not modeled in our upbringing, uh, we can look at other people who have them and be inspired as well. Mm. To choose friends who have the values that we would like for ourselves is a good thing too. And as we were discussing, yeah. also a lot of it comes back to worldview and acknowledging 
uh, where we stand before Allah, um, what is the nature of the things I have, uh, why do I have wealth, well, what is the point, uh, is it for me, is, is it, um, am I a guardian of the wealth, what does Allah intend for me to do with it, uh, and to look at it in that direction. Uh, I think to some degree, and I think you might have been touching on this a bit in this day and age, especially in uh, quote-unquote industrial societies, uh, it's an issue of where we derive our self-worth from. Uh, I don't think anyone who looked at the cusp of uh, modernity and industrialization and you know th things just as, uh, that we take for granted nowadays, like cars, buses, uh, grocery stores, mass production, and so forth, where a lot of goods have become available, uh, is that it's led to a phenomenon of uh, a lot of people very much valuing themselves based on what they have. Not, not to say people didn't do that before, or um, it doesn't happen anywhere, but I'm going to surmise that if you look, for example, Medina in the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, there wasn't as much pressure to value yourself based on your appearance or your clothing or your house or your jewelry or whatever, simply because there wasn't so much that was available. They were having famines all the time and uh, it took a lot of effort to, to make things by hand. It may be that self-worth tended to come from other directions. I heard someone say something once that stuck in my mind, and they said that as uh, the West in particular, I don't limit this to the West, but as the West has progressed, there's been a sort of regression in that the more that people have their basic needs met, mm -hmm. then the more a lot of our endeavors just, again, become jockeying for status in the way that the peacock, for example, shows off, off its feathers to try to get other birds and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, it's become like that because of the availability of goods. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, bread is fairly inexpensive and accessible to a lot of people. Um, not to say there isn't poverty, but uh, it's caused this to happen. And yeah, no one is immune. Uh, Muslims mm -hmm. are certainly not immune to this, but I think it's something that we can catch ourselves on mm -hmm. and, and look at how are we valuing ourselves and how will we value ourselves if we lose whatever we Absolutely. have. Absolutely. That's one, I just wanted to pick it's the role model, which I, I, you know, even psychology, we know these are really good ways if we want to embody a virtue, then yeah, we need to study it. And I think having role models and I just want to just kind of, lastly, just to kind of, I know we need to finish, but you know, Zainab salam and her courage in speaking out in the, the court of Yazid and I drew so much strength. I hate public speaking. I've managed to avoid it all my life up until now. And um, I just drew kind of courage and strength from her and her just ability to speak out and the courage it must have taken her. And so just knowing that she was able to do that, trying to connect with her, um, yeah, it's, it's helped me personally in trying to kind of yeah. do things that Thank I've Thank you been so much, of. Dr. Kate, for explaining to, to us all the way Ithar has has developed throughout time and the different examples we've had uh, from the Ahlul Bayt and how we can uh, work on it in ourselves and thank you for the Islamic perspective as, as well as just defining it for us because I think that was a common misconception. Um, your comments have been very eye-opening. Thank you so much for Welcome. being here today and thank you for joining us today on another episode of Karbala Reflections. It's been an honor to have both Dr. Kate and Dr. Amina discussing both the Islamic and the social perspectives needed to understand the definition of ethar and the necessity we have for it, especially in this day and age, where really being selfless is something frowned upon. We hope it was a beneficial conversation for you and we look forward to seeing you again. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>